um, go ahead and uh, come on in and uh, uh, get your handout, and we'll 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 get started. Um, can you turn that? Is that too loud or it's okay? Okay, I can hear it pretty loud. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I better get a. Kleenex. All right. <clears throat> it seems like we haven't been together for a while. At these, uh, it's hard to believe it's a new year. Um, the days keep flying by. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get uh, we'll dive back into uh, Daniel together. Let's pray. Father, we, we just truly uh, pray this morning that we would be able to reflect upon uh, who you are. Uh, it's hard to get our arms around your wonderful being, your, your person, and uh, we want to behold you this morning, God. We want to see you. And we know that the beauty that we see on the pages of Scripture is perfectly seen and revealed to us in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I want us to understand how from beginning to end you uh, are setting your name on display through the exaltation of of his person and work. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the radiance of your glory. If we have seen him, we have seen you. So please, Father, as we consider your greatness and your sovereignty and your power, your rule over the nations, uh, we know that you, dear Lord Jesus, love each one of us. If we are your children, you love us individually, personally, and have released us from our sins by your shed blood to be members of citizens of this coming glorious kingdom that will last forever. So help us to appreciate Daniel and his life and love for you. But even more than that, even more than seeing his integrity and life as an example for us, I want us to see you today, the true and the living God, the God of heaven, the God of Daniel, who you are our God. So bless our time. Help us to rejoice in who you are, and uh, may we be awestruck by our God today. We pray for your glory, Father. Amen. Okay, you know, Daniel uh, is a big picture book, and we're going to see that this morning in our lesson. Um, God sets everything up from beginning to end to shine the light on who he is, to exalt his name, to set himself on display. That's what God's about, not only with regard to the nations, but also your life, your individual life. It's about honoring him, setting him on display uh, in the midst of all the trials and troubles and circumstances we face every day. There's one purpose to it all, his name being exalted. So that's what the book of Daniel's about, and we're going to see that today as we go through. A lot, kind of a lot to cover, but... Uh, it's it's going to be, I pray, a blessing for us to just behold the beauty of our God. So in this section, 
um, Daniel reveals to Nebuchadnezzar the dream. Remember this, this magnificent uh, situation, this drama where the king has this dream that startles him and causes him great alarm, and we're going to see why again today. Uh, and, and it's so important that he gets the right interpretation that he does something that's unheard of. You, my, my wise men, you tell me the dream and the interpretation, and they are f- staggered. Nobody's asked that kind of request. And now Daniel told the king last time, King, I can't do that for you, but there is a God in heaven who can reveal this to you. So God has set the whole thing up to do what? Shine the light on who he is. An impossible situation. Doesn't he do that with his people? So that he can show himself to them as the one who handles impossible situations according to his good pleasure? You remember the Red Sea? They're the, the, Pharaoh's army is about to crush them, the seas before them, and, and Moses is praying, and God says, why are you crying out to me? Go forward through the sea. Well, he's that kind of God. And this section, Daniel reveals to Nebuchadnezzar the dream that God gave him. First, the dream. Then he gives the king the divine interpretation of the dream. In verses 36 through 45, this causes the king to do homage to the young prophet and to acknowledge the superiority of Daniel's God over all other gods. He also rewards Daniel by promoting him, making him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Through the dream that the God of heaven gives to the king, God reveals the future unfolding of the Gentile nations under which Israel will receive God's discipline for their apostasy until the establishment of the kingdom of the Son of Man, their Messiah. This is staggering, marvelous, powerful, divine reality that we're going to be looking at today. So let's dive in there. Daniel's declaration of the dream in verses 31 through 35. So, you, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large, and of extraordinary splendor was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Wow. So, there's this description in verse 31 of a single great statue. And uh, in my great technical marveling ability, I have a picture of that statue. I had a couple. Men, if you want to put those up, we're going to look just a chance to kind of get a rendering of those of the uh, statue. There we go. See that wonderful? There's the 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 statue. You can't hardly see the feet, but uh, it gives you an idea. Let's go to the next one. 
the next slide, and there it is again, another, the, the, different men render it different ways. Um, there was a little four minute uh, on YouTube video of it, kind of how they look at it and run around. It was pretty cool, but I didn't know how to get that for you. So I just picked a couple slides, but an awesome rendering of kingship with the different metals, okay? You can leave that up for just a second. Let's just, here we have verse 31. Daniel describes the greatness of the statue, saying that it was large and of extraordinary splendor, probably a brightness uh, caused by the metals themselves with light reflecting off of it. Um, its appearance was awesome. It, it was large, huge in his dream. The overall impression is that it was a fearful sight, causing alarm to the king as he beheld it standing in front of him, towering over him. Uh, remember who this is. This is the king of kings. And this statue is standing and towering over him, the one before whom everyone else prostrated themselves in his presence as he alone was exalted. Now there's this vision of this statue. He would have been dwarfed by it, humbled before its awesome appearance. And, and so just that initial uh, response, his emotional response to it, he would not have been used to experiencing these kinds of feelings because he's at the top of everything. Okay. Uh, in verses 32 and 33, Daniel describes the composition of the statue. And uh, Tanner has some good observations here just for you to have uh, in your notes. Begins with the head and then proceeds down until it reaches the feet. The head is of fine gold, okay? Whereas the feet are a mixture of iron and clay. So in between are the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, and the legs of iron. And he makes these observations. I think they're fair. First, the metals composing the statue are put in order of decreasing value. Highest value, gold down to uh, iron and clay mixture at the feet. Second, the materials are listed in order of increasing hardness, okay? Gold is the most pliable, whereas iron is the strongest, all right? And, 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 and we'll see as we move through Daniel that these qualities will reflect something about the kingdoms they represent. Third, the fifth and final material is unique in regard to the others. Why? It's not a pure metal, but rather a composite of metal and clay, which obviously do not easily blend or adhere to one another, and we're going to talk about that, the importance of that. Also, there's a, there's a connection between the feet and the legs, connection, um, namely iron, which probably suggests there's a connection between the fourth kingdom and the final manifestation of the kingdom with the, with the feet and the toes. Uh, the last stage is made of hard, hard, hard iron, but also brittle, yet fragile, baked clay, as God's revealing what's going to happen. Uh, in 34 and 35, then, Daniel describes how the king saw the destruction of this statue. So he knows it's about kingship. You can tell by looking at the statue. And then, awesome, and then there's the destruction of the statue. As he was intently gazing at the great and awesome statue, he saw a stone cut without hands. Now let me just pause. What what does that communicate? How, how, how did they normally have to deal with stones to make them work or fit or whatever? You had to, men had to do it. Why does he say this? What do you think the point is? We, we will see the point, of course, but any, just a thought. Cut without hands, very important.
it implies, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say, that it's not something man has produced or done. No hands. Cut without hands. We're going to see how that works. That stone then struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. So uh, the stone struck the statue at its most vulnerable point, right? Bringing the entire statue down. Uh, the crushing that began with the feet of iron and clay was seen by the king to bring a total crushing destruction of the entire statue at the same time as the crushing of the feet. And, uh, uh, and what's important then as we think about this one statue, but yet different kingdoms, there's a, there's a unity to the whole thing. There's a unity to the whole thing as we will see these kingdoms uh, unfold and they stand against God and his plans and he uses them, but they are anti-God kingdoms. They're one. And so when the final one is crushed, the whole statue is eliminated, is eliminated, okay? Um, and and, and it's, a, it's a pulverizing elimination <laughs> of the statue into what Daniel describes as similar to chaff from the summer threshing floors. And they would know what that is. I, I have an idea, which the wind carried away so that not a trace of this statue is left, not a trace of the various components of the statue were found after its pulverizing crushing. Um, and that's, that figure of chaff is used throughout Scripture to talk about judgment, not just on nations, but individuals, people. Um, I think a great example of that is Psalm 1. You know, I'm going to read it because we're dealing with a God who crushes wickedness and pulverizes it. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And I want you to see there's only, you know, there's, nations are dealt with by God, but there's only two kinds of people right now on the planet in this room. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, it's a, it's a heart issue, his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God. And in his law, his word, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit, roots going deep, yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Contrast, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. See, intimate relationship knows in that sense, and they know him. That's the definition of eternal life, to know God in that way. He knows them, but the way of the wicked will perish. Same thing is found in John the Baptist preaching as he heralds the coming of the Messiah, and he knows the Old Testament declares that the Messiah will bring this horrendous day of the Lord judgment on a wicked world, separating righteous from wicked. And John says about him, the Messiah coming, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. <laughs> People, you don't want to be chaff. 
when it's all said and done. You want to be wheat. But that figure is how God describes the destruction of this statue. These kingdoms standing against him. But the king saw after that that the stone that struck and crushed and pulverized the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A magnificent change. A magnificent change in rule, authority, kingdom is coming. It's coming. Well, can you, here's the king seeing this, you know. He doesn't know what's going on. He wants the interpretation. He's the greatest king on the earth. And he sees this statue. It's not hard to imagine how the awe which King Nebuchadnezzar first experienced as he beheld the great statue of kingship standing in front of him, how that turned to fear and terror as he saw its absolute destruction. I'm sure he's identifying with it. What other king could it represent? He's the king of kings. But then he sees it totally pulverized by the stone cut without hands. Now, one commentator, Baldwin, she, she speculates on, the, on some things concerning the king's fearful concern, and it's just speculation, but I think there's some truth to it. She, she says, there can be little doubt that this dream reflected the fears of the Babylonian king who had so recently come to the throne. His kingship is not far into, uh, it's not, he's not far into his kingship. It lasts a good long time, but at this point it's relatively new. In his dream, the statue stood for the king. He, he, she, I think that's fair. With his huge empire that he could scarcely hold, symbolized his maybe inadequacy in the face of threats from breakaway factions. I mean, when you have a kingdom like this, what's going on among the other kings? How can we throw this guy off? Right? Israel was part of that. As soon as there's a weakness seen in the king, let's, now's the time. Let's go to another king, Egypt or somewhere, and get rid of this king. Threats from breakaway factions. Maybe he had overreached himself and would fall. This stone which grew to fill the earth would have been a rival kingdom, which supplanted his, probably thinking, something like that. I think those are fair thoughts. Let's go to the next page. Page three, then. It's easy to see. Can't you see why King Nebuchadnezzar was so concerned to receive an accurate interpretation of this potential kingdom-threatening dream that he has. I've got to know what this means. I can't have conjurers and wizards and people schmoozing me and just telling me what they think and being positive. This is, I need to know. This is vital. I need to know. This was a dream like no other dream he had ever experienced, and so he does what he does. So now we have the marvelous interpretation of the dream. Remember, Daniel got his friends together and they prayed, Compassion, Lord, help us. Help us understand. And God is gracious, gives him an understanding. And, and Daniel doesn't take any credit to himself, does he? I can't do this. God alone can do this. Daniel explains how the statue symbolically represents, this is just an introduction, we're going to talk about it, the unfolding in history of various kingdoms that will come to power, beginning with the kingdom of Babylon, and exercise authority over the nation of Israel as God uses them to discipline Israel, still happening today, because of their hard-hearted, stubborn rebellion against him as a nation. This situation will continue in history, we'll see, until the God of heaven 
sets up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, but will endure forever. Hasn't happened yet, has it? It's coming. It's coming. As we hear Daniel's interpretation, the first question, of course, that scholars have dealt with and wrestled with over the over uh, centuries, really. What are the four primary kingdoms represented by the statue? And we all have an idea because we're, you know, it's been around a while how men have wrestled with this and how we've seen history unfold. Um, so Tanner helps us again, sets forth two major views. And, and I give this to you just because as you read different men, you're going to see different ideas but there's also something going on as men interpret the Bible that we need to be thinking about. Uh, most evangelicals today, regardless of their eschatological viewpoint, and virtually all early church fathers interpret the first four kingdoms as beginning with Babylon and extending to the Roman Empire. Critical scholars on the other hand, agree that Babylon's the first kingdom, but insist the fourth is Greece, not Rome. Okay? Um, now, it, before, we're going to read why they do that, but wh why would critical scholars want to limit it just to Greece and not have Rome? Well, remember, the critical scholars thought that Daniel was written later on. And critical scholars do not want to agree that it's a supernatural book that gives predictive prophecy because that, that's where they're at. See? So to have Rome in there means that there's supernatural reality taking place as God uses Daniel to prophesy about the future that hasn't happened yet. Oh, and we can't have that. The, the critical position stems from a bias against the Bible. Is there a bias against the Bible in our current culture? Yes. Why? Because the enemy hates the truth. And the enemy is always trying to undermine the supernatural authority of this book. Right? Since critical scholars reject the traditional authorship of the book of Daniel and attribute it to an unknown author, editor, around 165 B.C., during the Maccabean period, they cannot hold to Rome being the fourth kingdom. Rome did not come to power until after 165 B.C., and therefore to admit <clears throat> Rome as the fourth kingdom would be to admit that the Bible records true prophecy, which their presuppositions do not allow them to do. Isn't that amazing? Um, we're going to talk about why that just doesn't work. Excuse me. <laughs> But we know why that's the way men want to handle the word who don't believe in the God of the Bible. Anything to get rid of the supernatural power and authority, that's the enemy's desire. And dear people, he undermines the scriptures in blatant ways and very subtle ways. We're living in a culture where everything about our culture stands against the truth of God and his word. Everything. How do you raise your kids? How do you relate to your wife? What government's all about? What freedom is? No moral absolutes. Everything about our culture stands in opposition to this book. So it won't be long as our society crumbles. Thanks, honey. My honey did this. So that means keep going. Thank you, sweetheart. Until this book is being burned. Get rid of it. Evangelical Christians, however, have rightfully rejected the conclusion of the critical scholars and included the Roman Empire for the following reasons, and you have the reasons. 
Historically, there was no independent kingdom of Media that followed Babylon. Instead, Babylon was conquered by the Persian King Cyrus the Great, who ruled over the joint empire of the Medes and Persians. They're not two separate empires. They're one. Daniel 5.28, the handwriting on the wall declared that Babylon would be given over to the Medes and Persians, not merely to the Medes. Daniel 6.8 refers to the law of the Medes and Persians attesting that they were viewed by the author of Daniel, by Daniel, as one empire. In Daniel 8, two animals are used. We're going to see that to symbolize Gentile kingdoms, a ram with two horns and a shaggy goat. The latter is identified by the text itself as Greece, while the ram, one entity, represents Media and Persia. So the critical scholars are exposed in their foolish attempt to Dis, to, to do away with the supernatural reality of this book. So the correct interpretation would be that we have Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. Now Daniel can declare the interpretation. Three, two thirty six. The king ensured the proper interpretation of the dream by demanding that the interpreter declare first the dream itself. If he could declare the dream, which was clearly the harder of the two tasks, then he could surely give an accurate interpretation. Remember what's on his heart. Got to know, got to know. And Daniel, with an unwavering confidence in his God, states, this was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. Isn't that great? Wow. It's interesting to note, you note the plural pronoun. Now we will tell its interpretation. He includes his companions, and at the end we're going to see how he pleads for them too. He includes his companions in the God-given revelation and understanding of both the dream and its interpretation because they all were together and prayed and God revealed it to them through Daniel. <clears throat> the head of gold... Here we go. Remember that great picture that was up there? The head of gold. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them. You are the head of gold. Now, <laughs> page, page five, Daniel's divine interpretation must have been a relief to the king as he listened to it unfold and realized that the destruction coming to the statue by the rock cut without hands would impact not his kingdom. He's the head of gold and others are following, but a kingdom to come in the future. In fact, what Daniel told him about the God of heaven's plan for him personally was a positive statement about his present rule, wasn't it? You know, so he's, he's <laughs> hey, da keep going, Daniel. This is good stuff. Notice Daniel addresses Nebuchadnezzar as the king of kings. He was the ruler over other kings and conquered nations. And in his empire, his word was absolute law. <laughs> and then Dan Daniel makes it clear that his God, the God of heaven, who gave the dream to the king and also its interpretation, is the God This is who gave the king his kingdom power, strength, and glory. See, this is wonderful, people. This, who is Daniel? This young prophet from the Jewish nation, which was nothing before Nebuchadnezzar, and now the God of Daniel is making it clear who's in control. This is so wonderful how he deals with men and false gods as he brought about this to set his name on display. That's what God's about. 
He told the king that his God gave him the vastness of his rule, such that wherever the sons of men dwell or the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, he's given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them. Then he declared to Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Wow. So Daniel, in his declaration of the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, emphasizes the critical, absolute truth and point to the king that all that he is and has in his kingship has been given to him and caused to happen for him by the God of heaven, the true God, Daniel's God, Israel's God. People, this reality is the constant message of the book of Daniel. It's the constant message of the Bible. It's all about God and how we see him in the face of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. It's about his name, his fame, his glory. Even your salvation is not first and foremost about you. It's about him. Him setting himself on display. Him setting his grace on display. Him setting Christ on display as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's about him. It's not men or any false gods who are in control of the events of history. Isn't that true? Life or death, good, bad, whose hands is it in? What does the enemy want you to forget who's in control? And the one who's in control, if you're his child, loves you works all things together for good for you. Oh, may we cling to this reality. It's only the true God who reigns and rules over the heavens and all of his creation who is doing his will in all that is transpiring. Nebuchadnezzar, he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, you're only an instrument in his hands to accomplish his plan and purpose. Isn't that amazing? It's what we are, instruments in his hands to accomplish his plan and purpose to exalt and set Christ on display through our little lives. This was interesting. I found this interesting uh, in the terms of the cult- cultural context. It was common in the ancient Near East for kings to claim that their gods had given them their kingship. Archaeologists have unearthed an inscription written by Nebuchadnezzar himself in which he attributed his kingship to Marduk. Part of this inscription reads this way. From the upper sea to the lower sea, which Marduk, my lord, has entrusted to me, I have made the city of Babylon to the foremost among all the countries and every human habitation. Daniel destroyed that idea with what he's telling the king. He spoke frankly and boldly to this eminent king by confronting him with the truth that it was not Marduk or any other Babylonian god that gave Nebuchadnezzar his kingship or anything. Rather, it was the God of heaven, creator of the heavens, his kingdom or sovereignty, The power that he exercised and the resulting honor and glory he enjoyed had been given to him by the God Daniel worshipped. Isn't that great? Okay, the arms of silver, the belly of thighs and bronze. And let me just make one more comment before we press on. When Daniel calls Nebuchadnezzar the king of kings, that in history, that idea sets the stage for who's coming the ultimate king of kings and lord of lords, the one who's going to rule the eternal empire of God over Israel and the nations for all eternity, seated at the right hand of the Father, that historical reality is in history so we can understand how God's going to exalt Christ. Isn't that great? 
The nations are dropping the bucket to him. Christ is going to rule them to the glory of God the Father. A name above every name bowed down to. <clears throat> okay. Let's talk about medial Persia and Greece. I think there's a good quote here. I don't have to go through it, but it's about Tanner talks about how uh, the replacement of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, uh, he understood that it wasn't going to last forever. There's going to be another kingdom following him. He's the head of gold. He was blessed by God to rule from 605 to 562 B.C., followed briefly by his son Evel Merodach, and then two sons-in-law, and finally by his grandson Belshazzar, who we're going to encounter later in the book of Daniel. When Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. by a con combined army of the Medes and Persians, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, made famous by Nebuchadnezzar, came to an end. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know what kingdom or king would replace his own kingdom. He did know that the prophet says, after you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you than another third kingdom of bronze which will rule over the earth. So he knew it was going to be inferior to him. The question is, how is it inferior? Certainly the medio persian Empire was bigger than his and lasted longer than his. So the, the thought is that, is that last per, per, uh, sentence, perhaps the option would be in terms of inferior in regard to the authority enjoyed by the king. Nebuchadnezzar had unfettered power, but during the Persian Empire, the king was restricted in his authority, for he could not annul a law once he had made it. We're going to see that later in Daniel. So King Nebuchadnezzar had absolute authority to do what he wanted. Maybe that's the idea, that it will be inferior to you, the kingship in that kingdom. Third kingdom is Greece. Prominent, made prominent by the conquests of Alexander the Great. Alexander conquered Darius III, the last Persian king, at the Battle of Gagamela in 331 B.C., establishing the Hellenistic Empire, concerning the final comment by Daniel that this empire, this, this empire that he's speaking about, would rule over the entire civilized world. Tanner does make this comment. Up until this time, the territory conquered by Alexander the Great was the most extensive realm under the power of one king. He, he actually did virtually rule over the entire civilized world. See, these things are unfolding exactly as God says, because who's in control of history? Our God. Legs of iron. Fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like Iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these pieces. The legs of iron represent the Roman Empire. There's a quote there about their, they were like that. <laughs> they were like that. We're going to see in chapter 7, verse 23 of Daniel, that the fourth beast, when it goes through these beasts again, will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. That's what's going on with this kingdom. Who could resist Rome? Man, they pulverized people. They were brutal. Rome could virtually take whatever she wanted. Most countries were powerless to resist her. And Pompey brought that rule into Judah and, 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 and set the stage for how it unfolded there. So, Roman Empire, legs of iron. The feet and the toes, let's talk about that a little bit. We'll, uh, we'll unfold it as we read the, the bullet points, but following the revelation of the four kingdoms speaking about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Greece, and Rome, Daniel then interprets the feet and toes, which Nebuchadnezzar saw to be partly potter's clay, partly of iron. That's a weird idea. Saying that it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have the toughness of iron. That reflects the Roman Empire. Then he states that the mixture of clay with the iron meant that some of the kingdom will be strong, part of it will be brittle. And finally, he states in, in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, people combining together, but they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. Um, 
So let's keep going. You can kind of get the idea uh, 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 that th there's going to be a strength to it, but uh, it's not going to be as solid as uh, the other kingdoms. Okay. The description of the feet and toes being a mixture of iron and clay implies that this is a fifth kingdom coming after the Roman Empire, but somehow related to it. Since this fifth kingdom represents the mixture of iron and clay, uh, and, and that iron and clay, remember, that the feet are the direct object of the destruction of the stone cut without hands, okay? Representing God's kingdom, as we're going to see in 44 and 45. This must be, then, if, that's what, if, if, if it's destroyed by the kingdom God sets up, the feet and clay must be, represent the final anti-God kingdom destroyed by the returning Son of Man. And we're going to talk more about that in chapter 7, okay? So, it's related to the Roman Empire, but there's a gap, and it's the final kingdom that's coming that's destroyed by the returning Son of Man as, as his kingdom is set up. Okay, page 8. Miller, another commentator, you have here some characteristics of the fourth kingdom. I think that's fair. How are we doing? We're going to keep going here. Uh, but you can read through those things, uh, the, the issues of it being divided and yet still powerful, um, uh, kind of uh, held together but fragile. And it's, it's, of course, going to represent the kingdom, of, the final kingdom of the Antichrist on the planet, Okay. Um, peoples represented by iron and clay toes constitute one kingdom mixture, although they will not remain united. There's this, you know, and we're going to see when we get to chapter 7 that there's 10 kings that are involved under the headship of the Antichrist, and he abrupts some of them and that type of thing. But he holds it together because he's, the, he's Satan's man. He's Satan's man. All right, in conclusion, best interpretation to regard the legs as representing ancient Rome, feet and toes as a confederacy of ten kings still to come in the future. Since the feet, toes are partly of iron, this future kingdom probably has some connection to the ancient Roman Empire. And he talks about maybe coming from the same region, maybe involving the same kinds of uh, places where Rome ruled, that type of thing. Okay. But here we go. This is the key. <clears throat> this now, in 44 and 45, verses 44 and 45, this is where the great God, the God of Daniel, the God of heaven, the true and the living God, the God of Israel, is moving in history. We're in the middle of history. We're coming to the end of history. <laughs> but God is still doing what he said he's going to do here. He's doing it now on this planet. There's a goal. There's a purpose where God is moving. What is it? To establish the Son of Man, the Messiah, over the kingdom of the earth. To shine the light on His beauty and His majesty and His glory. To vindicate His name among the nations. To show everyone who He is. We're heading for this day. In the days of those kings of the last empire, the feet, clay, toes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. There's not going to be one coming after it, another nation, another people taken over. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it will itself endure how long? For all eternity. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So God's going to set this kingdom up. Page 9, a kingdom which will never be destroyed. It's not going to be left for anyone else. 
The entire statue is crushed. Remember that, 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 that there's nothing even left of any of those kingdoms that come before his kingdom. Not even a hint. Daniel concludes by stating that in giving him this dream, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Dear people, this is who God is. He set up the whole situation, didn't he? The king knows that the interpretation is trustworthy. Why does the king know the interpretation is right on? Because Daniel declared the dream to him. Right? Nobody could do that. <laughs> God gave the king what he demanded, that the interpreter declare to him both the dream and the interpretation. God caused King Nebuchadnezzar to demand this to set himself on display through Daniel. God set up the impossible situation so he could set himself on display through a humble, young Prophet from a Jewish nation. Does God do that with his people at times? Yeah. He does that. And he puts us with our back to the Red Sea sometimes, doesn't he? We, we see our, it's maybe not like this, but our situations in life sometimes just seem overwhelming and impossible. Why? So he can deliver you. So he can show that he's the one in control, keeping, working, ruling over all things, working all things together for your good, for his glory and your good. This is the God we know. Well, what's the result? Daniel and his friends are promoted, but listen to what happens. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face. The king of kings falls on his face and did homage to Daniel, gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. Immediately the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is God of gods, and get this, Lord of kings. and revealer of mysteries, since he has been able to reveal this mystery. Then he, then he promotes them. But let's just talk about his response. He, he pays homage to Daniel. Now, it's important to understand, Daniel did not see this as worship offered to him since he made no objection, and you know he would have if he's trying to worship him as something more than he is. But rather, Daniel sees this rather, this homage and respect given him because of the God he served. Because immediately, Nebuchadnezzar, he's bowing, talks about his God. Your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. Wow. The humility before Daniel and acknowledged an acknowledgement of the greatness and supremacy of Daniel's God is a magnificent display of God's sovereign power to humble the greatest of men, people, and expose the impotence of false gods to the glory of his name. Isn't that what he's doing here? None of the gods of Babylon could reveal the mystery or declare its interpretation, only the God of heaven. This is so great for us just to take it in. It's a confirmation that he, is, that he has the divine authority to bring about the interpretation of the king's dream because he is the Lord of kings. What's Nebuchadnezzar seeing? This God is going to unfold kingdoms, raise up kings, displace kings. He rules over the kings and the empires. Whew. Raising them up, bringing them down according to his sovereign desire to accomplish his plan and purpose. 
And what's the plan and purpose? Again, verses 44 and 45, he is moving in history to enthrone the Son of Man as the final King of kings and Lord of lords in fulfillment of what? His covenant promise made to David. You remember that? Your house, David, your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. That's what God's going to do. We're in the midst of it now, and it's coming. It's coming. (laughs) I think we're done. My wife just did this. Okay. (laughs) And, of course, they're exalted. And and Daniel's selfless about it. He, he He brings his friends with him. They're all now over Babylon. We're going to pray, but dear people, just final thought, Daniel's God is your God. He's our God. (laughs) He's now moving in history. He's moving history to its appointed end to establish his son, the son of man, the son of David, on the throne of the kingdom that will endure forever, a kingdom that will fill the whole earth. And people, what God has promised, he will do. There's a day of the Lord judgment coming on this world, followed by a glorious kingdom consummation under the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody cares about it but his people. But it's coming. And Paul says, you better flee from the wrath to come. Because it is coming. Because God's going to fulfill his word, his promise, right? And we're 2,500 years down the road from Daniel. We're getting close aren't we? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this magnificent book. It's a book, sure, it's a book about Daniel and his integrity and life and love for you, but it's a book about you. Who you are, what you are doing. It's a book about impossible situations that are in your hands. It's a book about how the nations are dropping the bucket compared to you, but it's also a book about how you care for your individual children like you did for Daniel and his friends, because everything is in your hands. Thank you that you are a God who fulfills your promises and that nothing can keep you from accomplishing your purpose. No one can call you into account and say, what are you doing? It's all for the glory of your great name as you set Christ on display for all eternity. And we as your children will get to be there with him as all these great events unfold. We will behold your glory one day in his face. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he's the lamb, but he's also the lion. And he's coming again. May we be ready. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. You're welcome.